later. <laughs> so, um, so well, I uh, thought of starting with this uh, short intro. Um, I think we, well, we all are aware that sievers are considered as good indicators of the marine environments and um, with their populations and dietary trends integrating all the changes that occur at the different levels of um, the trophic web in the oceans. And studying the foraging ecology of the sievers really helps us understand not only the role the seabirds have in the marine food web, but also the potential temporal and spatial variation in the foraging behavior can indicate the changes in the dynamic of the marine ecosystems. And then um, currently we're, several, well, we're facing several natural anthropogenic uh, threats for wildlife in the ecosystem worldwide. Needless to say that all these changes also are affecting us, but <laughs> we leave that for another conversation. Um, and then among these threats, we have these marine heat waves that you studied in your paper, uh, which are these prolonged extreme oceanic warm water events that are apparently increasing in intensity and can become more common with important impacts on marine wildlife. So in the Northern Pacific Ocean, there was this episode of a marine heat wave of a big magnitude with increases in temperature of the ocean of uh, three to four degrees centigrade, extending quite a lot of kilometers along the ocean with big consequences and disturbance uh, caused at different levels of the food wave. And uh, heat waves are apparently very sensitive indicators of food availability at sea and the preferences of cabling for cool waters link ocean temperatures and kitty wakes breeding success. For instance, the high temperatures reduces the cabling availability and this impacts in the productivity of the kitty wakes. Mm -hmm. So in this study called breeding seabirds increase foraging range in response to an extreme marine heat wave, Orla, Osborne and company <laughs> examine how space used in breeding kittiways varied within and across years before, during and after an extreme marine heat wave. And this happened between year 2012 to year 2018, sorry. And uh, well, what they did here was tagged um, between 12 to 60 birds, depending on the year, and you can check that on table one if you want to have more details. Uh, they tagged the birds with GPS loggers to record the foraging trips, um, and they tracked the kittiways over this six, period, uh, six year period of time, and both during the incubation and the chick rearing stages. So they can actually make comparisons um, between years and also between the different stages of the breeding cycle of the birds. Um, so after that, they just gather all the foraging locations and made a very fancy, very nice analysis. And you, if you want more details, they have a lovely figure where you can check that out. Uh, but basically, they classify the at sea movements into three to identify foraging, resting, and transiting areas. And they also calculated trip parameters like the total distance, duration, maximum distance. And they also perform kernel density estimations using only the foraging locations they classified beforehand. And they delineated the foraging ranges of the birds on each of the years studied. And this was actually really good because it allowed them to compare between the different years and see what happened before the heat wave, during the heat wave, and after it. Um, and they also, of course, studied the environmental variability, uh, the birds experience by analyzing the average sea surface temperature and uh, PDO index, which is Specific decadal oscillation index. And they compare that with the kitty weight productivity over the same period of time. So, as expected, uh, duration, um, uh, so the different trip parameters varied among the years, 
uh, and also the size of the foraging areas varied on each of the year studies, and that can easily be observed also in figure, one, uh, figure sorry, three, which is uh, quite um, <laughs> interesting to look at. And you can see that there is less dispersal in the years uh, 2012 and 13, which is the years before the marine heat wave. And, and then you can see how they double, the foraging areas double in size uh, up until 2018, which is past the marine heat wave. So they get results like uh, PDO and SST increase from 2012 to 2016 and then felt, and that corresponded also to a decrease in the kitty wave productivity. So this was actually affecting the bird's productivity. Um, so uh, prior to the heat wave, there was a higher reproductive success and a higher proportion of capling in the diet of the birds. So this is definitely a couple situations. So, um, Sorry, post dinos, I'm checking all my notes here. <laughs> post marine heat wave years apparently um, were similar in response as the years during the marine heat wave. So what they are saying here in this paper is that the effect of the heat wave on the local ecosystem actually continued even after the heat wave itself passed or dissipated. So this is another very interesting thing. Um, they found that uh, all the distances the birds covered during the, the years after the heat wave were still more than double that the distance that the birds covered during either incubation and chick rearing in the years before the heat wave. So this is actually a big difference for the birds. So in these papers, uh, in this paper, kitty waves responded to this Northern Pacific marine heat wave in two ways. They increased their foraging areas and they also changed, uh, changed the trip characteristics as the bird increased their search effort and uh, to find adequate prey in environments um, where prey apparently were more dispersed and less profitable. So comparing the birds, um, the birds foraging uh, behavior before, during, and after the marine heat wave, uh, the authors can say that actually kitty wakes are capable of flexible foraging strategies leading to variability in the foraging areas and the foraging behavior from year to year. But apparently the productivity um, declined and this, um, you know, it could take a while until we actually notice the effect of this decline in the recruitment and the population dynamics. So the result in this work suggests that the intervening years between the marine heat wave events become uh, warmer on average and the kitty wave population is less likely to encounter the necessary conditions to actually recover from that. So, and of course, this uh, impacted other seabirds and other marine wildlife living in the area, I guess. Uh, something that called my attention when reading this paper is that they express how these marine heat waves um, are predicted to extend in duration, increase in frequency and intensify uh, in magnitude. So, um, at this point, when I was finishing reading the paper, I felt a little bit like surprised and at the same time sort of like helpless because I was, you know, when you reach the end of a paper like this one, you kind of like start thinking about uh, what management actions we can take over, right, to sort of like mitigate this kind of um, situations. But since this is caused by a natural event, or sort of natural event, we are kind of like accelerating. I was, um, I don't know, hoping to uh, to hear what, uh, if there's something that you can say about, is there anything we can do <laughs> to help or to mitigate, or I don't know, um, if, if there's something we can do about this, um, if you thought about it and what are the, the suggestions that you have, and 
And also another thing that caught my attention, like I actually work on the other side of the world <laughs> where you guys are. Uh, but in this kind of scenarios, um, we usually remark how important it seems to be for seabirds uh, to be flexible in their foraging behaviors. Uh, we say the same thing of the birds that live here in the South Atlantic Oceans. Uh, but apparently in your study, this, this um, flexibility seems to be not enough uh, for the birds. So if you can touch that a little bit and see why that is and if you want to discuss that a little bit, that would be nice. Thanks, Nat. Uh, Orla and Kyle, I, I'll, I'll throw it over to you guys to, uh, to, to pick on which of those points you want to hit first. Uh, yeah. Nat, oh, before you continue, too, I realize that your co-author, um, I think it's uh, Shannon, is online as well. If She hasn't messaged me, but if, if she wants to be unmuted, uh, just uh, Shannon, if you can hear me, please uh, drop me a message and we can unmute you if you want to join in the conversation. But uh, anyways, please go ahead. Awesome. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll start and then Kyle and Shannon can fill in, fill in the gaps. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, I, I, a lot of these, <laughs> this research can be pretty uh, disheartening. Um, but they're also it's super duper important. So I think just pumping out more research like this is really important. Um, in and of itself and, and also it's specific to this one, it is pretty interesting and, and possibly can be incorporated into decision making in terms of marine protected areas or marine spatial planning. Um, just the fact that uh, events like this, you know, given that they'll become more intense and uh, occur more regularly, it is important to know how uh, seabirds will respond so that that can be accounted for. Um, you know, the kittiwakes in this situation aren't competing against fisheries, but, you know, many populations and other species might be doing so as well. And, and that's another, that's kind of like a double whammy. And so those considerations should be, should be taken as well. Um, yeah, so it is pretty disheartening, but it's super, super important, like a lot of research. Um, and even though this didn't look at the marine protected area side of things or marine spatial planning, it, it could be kind of used or, uh, in, in that respect. Um, and then what was the other thing? The flexibility of, yeah, yeah. So the flexibility or plasticity of the kidney reef foraging is, is pretty interesting. Um, so it is, it does look as though, you know, the kidney are doing everything they can and they're really pushing the boundaries and, and, and still, you know, in 2016, productivity is still super duper low and it's like, oh, is it really helping? Um, but then in 2017 and 18, if you look at the uh, foraging characteristics and, um, you know, they're going even further, they're spending even more time and, and it looks like there's a lot more effort being expended in those years and productivity does actually increase modestly. So, you know, is that noise? It's, you kind of got to be cautious drawing conclusions there, but at the same time, it, it does kind of beg the question. It's like, okay, well, is it the nature of, of the prey out there and like the foraging conditions and so that is that to me is interesting that's kind of a, a not unanswered question but uh, <laughs> um yeah they have got this insane capacity for 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 changing their their foraging strategy which is awesome and it does kind of yeah. seem like maybe in some situations it pays off and maybe under other uh, foraging conditions it it doesn't, that's kind of my take on it, Kyle. I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I guess I could an answer both questions as well, just like Orla did, kind of building off on what, of what she said. Um, you know, the, the Middleton Island colony there uh, forages within Prince William Sound where there was uh, Exxon Valdez in the, in the 1980s. And I think that's a great example of how, uh, you know, seabird, con you know, seabird science and seabird conservation can, can directly re relate to conservation, right? I mean, uh, Exxon Valdez was a huge impetus for, uh, um, in, you know, environmentalism and, uh, you know, it was an iconic event, uh, terrible at the time, but uh, the repercussions have been very positive in, in many ways. Um, 
and uh, part of the, you know, the, the study is partly funded by the uh, um, by the settlement from Exxon Valdez. So that's an example of you know something where there's a there was an issue, there's this big cataclysmic problem, but it was relatively easy to solve. I mean, there's uh, there was no real long term effects uh, of Exxon Valdez, at least in terms of the the seabird populations at Middleton. They, there's been a lot of changes, but they haven't. Uh, um, uh, th there's nothing clearly linked to that that oil spill. In contrast with climate change, it's just such a, a much more difficult beast to work with. Um, and uh, you know the, uh, the the North Pacific uh, has been switching back and forth kind of every 30 years between a warm spell and a, a cold spell. And, uh, and you know the, the famous regime shift was there in 1977, and uh, it switched to warm. And at that point, Middleton was the largest kittiwake colony in the world, and 180,000 birds. It was enormous. And now, basically, there are no kittiwakes on the island except for the ones which we um, which which live on our structures. Uh, many of which are fed. And um, so uh, clearly there, there's a natural part of that cycle, but in 2008 it switched back to cold and then we had this blob and now we're dealing with the sun of the blob in 2019, really warm water uh, as well. And so climate change has kind of completely messed up that, that signal. Um, in terms of what can we do? Well, we can have intense management like we have at Middleton. I mean, basically every kitty wake um, has a, uh, a protected site on the tower and many of them are fed and much of the recruitment comes from those fed individuals. And uh, so there, there are things we can do, we can help them um, by feeding them, by uh, you know, providing sites, uh, but you know, in the long term, that, that's not really a great solution to climate change. Um, so it is certainly disheartening and obviously uh, there's much bigger questions and um, things that we have to deal with as a society, but at least we can put the message out there that, hey, here's another example of something being impacted by climate change, uh, clearly right here, um, you know, in, in, in Alaska. Uh, in terms of flexibility, uh, yeah, I mean, clearly the kitty wakes are kind of a classic example of a bird that, you know, is flexible. Um, they don't have anything to do but to go further. Uh, they're not like a diving bird. You know, I work with MERS uh, uh, primarily, and uh, for them, at least they can dive deeper, they can, um, they can somehow change the three dimensions. Uh, Kittiwakes only have the two dimensions to work with, so they have nothing to do but go farther. And uh, in those really warm years, when the capelin was, you know, weren't uh, weren't present, um, that's what they did. I mean, it was incredible. We had no idea that they were going to, you know, fly 300 kilometers away. And clearly, those individuals had just given up on on foraging. I mean, it was actually uh, there were a few of the, the individuals that had been away for four days and just so we could get the GPS back. I mean, we didn't want to manipulate things too much, but we fed, um, we had to feed the chicks at the end to be able to get the chicks to survive. So they, when the adult came back, we could get the GPS off. And um, it was almost like the adult arrived back and was, what are you doing here? Why do I still have a chick? Um, and uh, uh, so I mean, clearly those individuals had basically given up on reproduction. At some point there was just a threshold that uh, that was crossed and they they had the flexibility to go further, but at the, the sacrifice of um, the offspring. And I think one of the really interesting things about Middleton is you really do have this boom and bust cycle in the, in the Atlantic seems a little bit more like the kitty wakes are sometimes in between, but at Middleton it's either there's very low production or um, most of the, the, the pairs produce offspring, which has been very rare in recent years. Cool, thanks guys. Nat, do you have any more questions? I have one more, yes, if you allow me. <laughs> Please, please, I insist. Uh, okay, um, so this one, um, you did not took prey samples, at least not in this study, but I was wondering if you could actually see some of this uh, variation in the diet occurring uh, during this period of time, if you could actually, maybe for another uh, paper or maybe another research you were doing at the same time, you got some um, diet samples or some isotopes or something like that that show you that transition or that change in, um, you know, they were eating a lot of capeling in the beginning before the heat wave and then what happened after that, if you have some rec records of that. I'll let you answer that one, Kyle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I can answer that. Sure, yeah, I mean, we, we continue to take voucher specimens and uh, um, sure enough, uh, there was Capelin in 2012 and 2013, uh, but uh, from 2014 onwards, Capelin has been a very small part of the diet and uh, replaced by um, you know, other, uh, other species, you know, much more diverse diet now. And uh, 
So yes, we do have those voucher specimens. They weren't analyzed as part of that study because we didn't have them associated with those individuals with the uh, with the GPS units. But we're we're trying to do that now to to do um, you know basically when the bird comes back, it re comments up on us uh, if it's been successful, and uh, and then we're able to collect a, a, a voucher specimen for for that. And um, and so in future we hope to be able to actually be able to map out okay this bird went here and this is what it brought back. And so we now have. A handful of samples like that and we're hoping to build on that in the future. Yeah well maybe even if it's not associated to the bird with the GPS it might be interesting to see how the foraging niche or the isotope niche varied like you know enlarge or whatever happened um, at the same time as the foraging ranges actually uh, were larger as well. I was thinking more like uh, of the big picture. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, and we, we do have those data there. Uh, I guess a little bit of the, the history of that paper, I, and Orly can jump in here, but uh, uh, those, the diet data actually we were asked to add in by a reviewer afterwards. And so we went back and, and we, uh, um, or the, the uh, you know, some of those data we were, at, you know, we were asked to add in uh, you know, at the end. So it wasn't part of the original study. And so we added one of those figures in um, a little bit later on. And uh, so certainly in the future, we could, we could have a look at, uh, you know, try and tie a little bit, um, more closely, especially as we add more more years, because uh, even with six years, that's you know, only a sample size of six. Um, but we now have more and more years. Uh, we have two more years now, so uh, we might be able to make a closer association between the foraging, the diet, and the reproductive success. Awesome, thank you. All right, David, uh, do you have any any questions for our authors today? Yeah, very nice work. Um, maybe two points. Uh, the the first was that I was I was really interested to see the uh, the hysteresis in in the response. The fact that uh, you know after the perturbation there was uh, well the the, uh, the status didn't come back to the initial stage. Uh, that's uh, that's very fascinating because when when we look at functional responses, the one we need afterwards, you know, for modeling work, we just uh, assume that. Uh, if a perturbation is, is gone, you come back to the initial stage. So uh, it's, it's a fascinating thing, that, uh, which makes things even more complicated, I guess, if you want to, uh, to model uh, future trends. Uh, that's, that's the first point, more of a, a comment. And, and my question uh, was about environmental conditions, because um, before people were excited about um, blobs and, and, uh, and warm water events. They, they were excited for a long time and decades about El Nino events. And, uh, and some of the discussions uh, of the current discussions remind me of that phase. One of the predictions with El Nino was that because of climate change, we would, we would move towards sort of permanent El Nino conditions. Um, and, and I was wondering whether uh, for the, at least for the North Pacific, uh, some of the predictions about warm events would go also into that direction that at some stage, you know, it would just um, more or less tropicalize permanently. Do you want to start, Orla? Uh, no, you, you talk about it and I'll... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Well, I thought there, there seemed to be two parts of your question there. I mean, one part is about the, the hysteresis and... Um, I mean, Shannon could talk more about this uh, as well, but I mean, she's been looking at timing of, uh, of breeding in kitty wakes, and uh, we anticipated we had one of these climate window um, analyses, and we kind of expected the first few months to be really important. That uh, you know maybe that uh, breeding in um, uh, the best predictor of timing of breeding in uh, May or June would be what was happening in April or March, perhaps. And so she did a bunch of analyses there, and it was quite weak. And what she's actually found now is that uh, it's actually two years previous that uh, is important. So there's a really strong signal from, you know, conditions two years previous in you know, the spring two years previous to the timing of breeding. And so this was a big surprise for us that there was this kind of delay, this lag in the system. And uh, in, in some respects, it makes sense because they're primarily feeding on, uh, you know, two year old fish. And so maybe what was happening two years ago actually is really important. Um, but it does make modeling very you know, very difficult when you have to deal with these nonlinear uh, relationships. Um, and uh, then in the second part of your, your question there about uh, El Nino, um, I mean, El Nino doesn't seem to be as important as the Pacific Decadal Oscillation for this particular system. Uh, but 
uh, they're often um, clearly linked. And, um, and certainly it seems like, you know, rather than having this warm, cold shift going back and forth, um, you know, the way El Nino and La Nina works, um, but on a longer time scale, like 30 year time scale, uh, it seems like, you know, climate change is just overriding that and we're supposed to be in a cold um, period and now it's been almost a decade that it's been warm. So mm. uh, it seems like the North Pacific has become a much warmer place permanently. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Yep, absolutely. All right. Um, and with that, uh, let's see, if there, is there anybody in the audience who might have a question for our authors? I haven't seen anybody raising their hands or throwing shoes at the screen, so <laughs> I'm assuming that means there's no, no burning questions at the moment. Um, I had just had a quick one for you, for you probably directed at you, Orla. Um, did you have a chance to look at um, foraging flexibility in other, at other study sites? Have there been other studies in Kitty Wakes that have done something similar and seen that kind of foraging plasticity? And, um, and if so, is it, is it comparable to what you guys have seen in your data? Uh, so I would say yes. Um, I'm trying to think of the, the specific studies. I think Dumps 2002. I, I, I'm not sure exactly, but yeah, they they did. They basically did see that. Now I, I can't remember exactly whether they were particularly uh, good at buffering. Like you know, the, uh, they were going further, and and uh, and that that would. You know, you think, okay, that's great. They, they're, they've got this plastic foraging strategy where they can change as needed. Um, I can't remember now, though, whether their productivity suffered or not, or whether they were they were good at buffering. Um, I can't bring that to mind. But there were there were actually quite a few studies. So we, I, it was the the extent to which they were able to to kind of change the foraging strategy and just push it. Um, you know, push it that much further and uh, longer was pretty amazing. But um, based on previous studies, the fact that they could kind of shift wasn't terribly surprising to me. Um, yeah, sorry, I don't have the, the exact papers and studies that were done, but yes, there there were. Right. Oh, Joe, you've got your finger up. I'll, uh, I'll unmute you here. Let's see. Uh, you might have to, oh, actually, you might have to unmute yourself. It's telling me to ask you to unmute yourself, Joe. Oh, there you go. Okay. Hey, Joe. I did. I did. I, hi. Good to see everybody and everybody's still safe. Um, I have a question. If this population has been fed for 20 or 25 years, what happens to the offspring? Do they expect the same smorgasbord or do they go off other places and have normal behavior? Well, I... Orly, do you want to take a, a stab at that, or would you like oh, me to? Oh, no. <laughs> That's for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's only a small subset which is fed. Uh, so there's uh, um, 90, 90 pairs which are fed out of 500 or so that are accessible on the tower and probably 1,000 or so on the tower. So it's a small subset which are fed. Um, and they, uh, they certainly uh, recruit very strongly and back onto the tower. Presumably some go off uh, elsewhere, but we, we don't get to, um, we don't see those uh, very, you know, a few have been recorded at other colonies, but... Um, uh, in many cases, it would be difficult to know. Um, so, the, and yes, they they are they are definitely a, a different group. In fact, um, one of the best predictors of subsequent success is whether or not they're not whether or not they were fed in a particular year, but whether or not they were fed as an offspring. So, I, I you know, it's kind of, there certainly seems to be a, a silver spoon uh, um, effect there, mm -hmm. and that those individuals which got a lot of food as as uh, chicks were just built better and better able to to um, survive even under um, poor conditions. Um, it does seem like we also select for spe specific kitty wakes on the tower. They seem to be a bit bigger than, I mean, just even when they first arrive, bigger, heavier. Um, they're the, the, you know, the, just a, a, a tougher individual that gets those really good sites which are fed because all the kitty wakes are aware that there's some sites which are, are fed and there's a lot of fighting and a lot of um, aggression to get those sites. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Um, now, unless we've got any more pressing questions, I think I think we're probably ready to move on to the next paper. Um, Orla, Kyle, thank you very much for that. And thanks for the lovely paper um, and for your work. Middleton Island is- Thanks for the invitation. I, I never ever got to go to when I was in Alaska. And uh, I'm very jealous that you guys get to, get to work with these folks. So um, great. Thank you. And I think we'll, we'll move on to our next one. And we've got, uh, Julianne is on. Oh yes, I see you're, you've actually got your camera on there.
Um, Hi. Hello, Julien. Bonjour. How are you? Hi, Julien. Fine. Thanks. Good. Yeah. Are you, are you hi hiding in the dark, Julien? Yeah, kind of. Like, but if I if I open the window, then then you won't see me. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know the problem. It'll be a halo. <laughs> thanks, uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks for joining and um, and publishing that very nice uh, paper indicating that uh, albatrosses can memorize locations of uh, predictable fishing boats, but uh, favor natural conditions. Uh, so that's uh, a paper you're co-signing, Julien, with uh, Henri Weimerskirch. We, we were hoping to attract uh, Henri to the session. I, I don't think, I don't think uh, it, uh, it really worked. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be his boss from next January. I'll, I'll see if I manage to have a bit more, uh, a bit more <laughs> insulin on, on, his, uh, <laughs> on his behavior. So in the, in the Southern Ocean, uh, wherever there are fishing vessels, you can see clouds of black broad albatrosses, uh, for instance, that's a classic picture uh, on the Patagonian shelf where most uh, black broads live. And um, attending these uh, vessels for cheap food completely modifies the uh, natural foraging behavior of the birds. And uh, there's the general assumption that they get, they get addicted to this, uh, to this resource. Uh, this might be problematic because in a world where managers are trying hard to reduce or to completely ban uh, fishing discards, some seabird populations uh, might be left with far less to, to eat. Uh, but maybe it's not as bad as it seems. Uh, for instance, in gannets, uh, which are also typical attendants of fishing vessels, there's more and more evidence that birds immediately switch back to eating their natural prey whenever available. Uh, that's the case for Cape gannets in the Benguela and northern gannets in the English Channel. Yet, uh, whether seabirds actually memorize the position of fishing vessels and actively go back to them uh, remain to be uh, investigated. So, Julien, you, you did your PhD with Henri Weimerskirch on uh, albatross fishery interactions uh, at CNRS, and, um, and you released a kind of a, a stream of, of papers in, in the process. And the, the publication we discussed today is, uh, might be a high point um, and, and in this publication, you really had the feeling that Julien, who is a, a, a very a bright guy, said, uh, well, let's see if I can design hypotheses and predictions until the reader's brain melts. Um, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell, uh, you, you had the GPS tracking data for 85 uh, black broads from Kerguelen, uh, which performed repeated trips uh, during the cheek rearing phase. Uh, they foraged on the Kerguelen Plateau, and at its periphery, they sometimes met with longliners targeting Patagonian toothfish. Uh, the nice thing is that you also had positions uh, for these uh, fishing vessels, so you could determine where and when birds and uh, vessels met. Uh, what you found was that black broads had the capacity to memorize where they had encountered fishing vessels and, and to actively seed these areas during following trips. Uh, they were coming back to the same spots uh, within one kilometer, more than expected by luck. Uh, so um, if, if they did so, they, they doubled the probability to encounter a vessel uh, because fishing operations in one area usually lasted for days and days, longer than it took for the bird to go feed its chick and come back. So the, the, the birds clearly had the, the capacity to, to memorize these areas Yet, more than half of the time, during repeated trips, they did not fly back to the fishing vessel, and the arriver chose to switch to another area to feed on natural prey. Um, individual black broads have been shown in previous studies to target specific foraging spots year after year, uh, but in this study, you, you found that they are more flexible than expected. And, and actually, it's as if you know, the albatross uh, would, would say, well, you know, I, I know very well about that fishing vessel. It's there, you know, I, I could go there, but no, no, I, I prefer natural prey. Um, so importantly, at the population level, fishery discards might not be that crucial, at least for Kerguelen uh, black broads, but you, you warn uh, that during other breeding stages like incubation, birds might, might be maybe more attracted to vessels. And also, uh, you know, the many immatures and non-breeders have to be taken into account. Maybe, maybe they are more free of their movement and hence um, more numerous at the back of, of fishing vessels. 
uh, the fascinating point, of course, in this study is that one more, it stresses the navigational cap capabilities of, of seabirds. And uh, here, albatrosses were capable of coming back to the same kilometer square of Southern Ocean, even in the absence of, uh, of fishing vessels, because sometimes, you know, they intended to find back the fishing vessel, but the fishing vessel was, uh, was gone. So um, congratulations on, on, on this uh, very uh, nice analysis. And uh, obviously, you, you tortured the data in, in amazing ways. And, and also, you, you provided interesting new hints for methods. Uh, for instance, you stress uh, the importance of using permutation tests um, to, to work on some of your hypotheses. I, I was wondering whether you could tell us a little more about uh, how, this, how this works. Yes, so um, so this permutation actually it started because I was asked to um, by reviewers from a previous version to be more specific about the scale at which they returned to where they found boats. So, so I measured where they found, well, I identified where the birds found boats and then on the next trip I, I measured the distance to where they passed from, from this place they had previously found a boat. But the problem is then I don't know this distance that I measure what I should expect. Um, like how, like if, if you suppose that the bird is just searching by chance, like randomly, like how close you would, would you expect it to, to go from this place? And if you expect that the bird is, I don't know, he, have, he has a, a favorite spot, but that is completely unrelated to the boat, but is close by to where the boat is, then then, then you might think that it goes back often to the boat, but it's actually not linked to the boat, but to whatever it, it prefers there. Um, so, so the the idea was to account for all of that, and the permutation pr procedures then then are very uh, convenient for that because if you want to simulate, like to simulate a theoretical is doing that, you would have to make so many assumptions that you would get lost uh, into that, that, I think. So my point was to compare how close they went to the place where they found boats before to how close they would go from the place they will find boats later. And because I, I know that they can't know where they will find boats later, I know that this is just by chance if they go close to where they found boats later. Um, and so this is my baseline and then I, I can see that they approach past boats closer than, than future boats. And, and along the same line, you, you also use the argument of uh, the birds uh, making uh, cognitive mistakes. Um, could, could, you, could you also tell us uh, slightly more about that? Yes, so if you, if, if you make your decisions based on, on your memory, so on what you have seen before in your own life, then this might in some cases be wrong because you, you're not using the most up-to-date information, you're using what you remember. So if you go to where you found boat, you will return where, where it was before, but maybe the boat is not here anymore. And, and this is what we observe actually. So they go very close to where they found boats before, but at, at this moment when they go back there, uh, the boat is not within perception range. It's, it's several tens of kilometers away, the next boat. Um, and so I, I yeah, call that mistakes. So it's, it's a, a marker of how, how the brain is probably processing the, the information, the past information of the, the found boats here. So maybe it's still here. But you had, a, you had a small proportion of these events compared to the total data set. So, uh, so, you, so you use that, that uh, so to say, these rare events where birds are making mistakes to uh, strengthen the overall argument, uh, but but uh, you know one could turn it on its head and and to say that it's a small proportion and that overall they were very efficient at what they were doing. So um, so that you know they, they they didn't miss that many boats when they wanted to go for them. Is is that correct? I'm I'm not sure. Well, all the, all, all the, so I, I identified 14 events where the bird was within one kilometer of where it found a boat previously. 
And of these 14 events, actually in, in 13 of them, there was no boats around. Okay. And, and in the one event where there was a boat, so it, it, the, the bird again interacted with the boat. So the boat had not moved in, in between the, the two bird foraging trips. So it, it, it interacted with it the, in both trips and at the same place. Um, and and maybe the confusion arises from from the fact that this is looking at very fine scales, so one kilometer scale, mm -mm. Uh, and it's it's so fourteen birds did that from the about I don't know thirty that had found a boat and returned in the same general area, but then another forty other birds they did not even try to go close to this area, like they they just like if on on first trip they went northeast and the, the second trip they went southwest and so there they were they, there was almost no chance that they would go back to where they, the boat was before mm. and it's a bit of a rhetorical question but uh, you, you have a very uh, specific setup there on the Kerguelen plateau with uh, the birds in the middle on on Kerguelen and and then uh, all the fishing vessels uh, in specific spots at at the periphery can, can you anticipate that working in a completely different system where, for instance, fishing activities would be more evenly spread, would this have a, a potential influence? Do, do you think that you had very specific conditions there which may you know, preclude um, making general statements on, on how uh, at least black broad albatrosses function? I think this particular situation greatly helped for the analysis because mm. I didn't have to account for the distance. Like I knew that if they wanted boats, they would need to reach the shelf edge because the boats they, they exclusively operate there. Uh, if, if the boats are everywhere at any distance from the colony, then, then the analysis will be more complex. Um, but I, I, I don't think it would make a difference for, for the birds themselves, like in, in, in their strategy. Ron, do you, do you have any points? Yeah, I just, as a, as a quite a cool paper and, and very fascinating, uh, fascinating concept that the, these birds are able to actually memorize where these, these boats were. Um, I guess, I mean, the, the first thing that comes to mind, which I, I guess is pretty difficult to, to answer is, is, you know, what's the mechanism for them remembering, you know, are they, how do they know that that boat is there? I mean, we, we see the, the ocean as this barren landscape and, you know, the, the theory behind birds finding foraging locations, especially procellariforms, is that they're queuing in on uh, olfactory hotspots, right? So they, they can smell their way to these, these, um, these areas. So, you know, how are they, how are they able to, to know exactly where that boat was from the previous trip? Um, I grant, granted, that, that's a little bit of a complex uh, question to answer obviously but the where I'm getting with this is how do you disentangle the the fact that the fishermen and the birds are going to hot spots that um, that overlap you know the the boats are these guys are fishing in places where they know there's fish are the birds just going back to places where they know there's fish and it just so happens that boats uh, are are occurring in those exact same places, or is there um, there's something else? So how do how do you disentangle those? If we follow your hypothesis, and and boats and birds are targeting independently the same spots, then we would expect that the birds would have the same chance to be close to boats of their future trip than to their past trip. But we observe that they approach the, the, the boats they have seen before, but not the boats they will see later. Um, and this is the first thing. And, and the second thing is the, what I call the personal information prediction is that the birds only approach the places where themselves they attended the boat there, but not where other individuals before attended the boat around. So, it's, so they really come back to the boats they personally have experience with. Like, um yeah i think yeah do you, do you think that your 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 study would merit from from 
further tracking. So how do you, do you reckon that if you, you did, you repeated this again, um, you know, in, in two years time, do you reckon you would find similar patterns? And, and actually I, following up on that, does, does uh, perhaps the type of ship or the size of ship have any Im impact on this? So you have, you know, if you have a larger, say super trawler, would that be more likely to create an impact on, on these birds versus say a small long liner where they may not get as much, um, as much payback for visiting it. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, I, I can only speculate on that. Um, but it's probably, yeah. So this is one hypothesis we discuss is maybe this is linked to the food reward they get at these boats and, and they, so these fleets, it's only seven different boats. So it's very reduced uh, fishing fleet. And, and they have a lot of mitigation measures to limit bycatch. And this includes like uh, not discarding any, any fish. So the only thing they can eat the birds when, when they interact with these boats is the fish that gets, that just by chance gets unhooked when the line is hauled. Yeah. So it's sometimes, and, and it's, we try to quantify that, but it's very hard. So we don't know exactly how many individuals can actually feed at these boats, at this particular fleet. So maybe, maybe they don't remember or they don't go back so often because these boats are not providing a lot of food. Um, and, and yeah, maybe, maybe in, in 10 years time, if, if we do the same kind of study, we can see if, if it changed and um, so that, yeah, so that's a really important point because uh, because of, of course you know this, that makes the uh, the vessels far less uh, attractive uh, in terms of vessel size. I think that the, in in this fleet, you know, the all, all sizes are pretty similar, uh, where you you don't have so to say small vessels because it's the middle of the Southern Ocean. So uh, um, so they're, they're fairly large and standard size. So uh, so I think there's little variability there, but uh, but it's a key point, you know, about the the small volume of stuff discarded. Uh, of course, you know, it makes it far less attractive. Would have been nice to know, you know, the, uh, the, the pattern. And, and actually there is, there is tracking for that population for a long time. So there might be a way to, uh, to check this in the longer term. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Do we have any questions from the audience? Nat, do you, do you have any questions for Julianne while you're, uh, while you're here? No, but I think someone wrote in the chat. I was checking yeah, that. Just yes, that. there is a, a question from uh, from Jan down there as to how much you think social exchanges at the nest between partners influence the zones um, the bird will target. And there's a bit of a discussion under that. But maybe you could maybe you could touch on that a little bit, um, Julia. Yeah. So so I so I was not for the I was not here for the seabird session on on. Uh, Nicolas' paper, but uh, well, I saw the paper on Gannets uh, about this kind of ID. Um, so I, I have no idea if it could work on 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 albatrosses. Um, so I don't know how the discussion went on, on the on the Gannets. I, I was a bit skeptical on on like the information that was seem, that seemed to be passed on would be the duration of the trip, but that might be one thing that the partner would be able to know without the partner uh, signaling on, on it, right? Well, the partner could. Um, well, it was, um, it was also it was also about signaling to neighbors and not okay. not, not directly uh, on only to, to the okay. partner, but providing you know public information to everyone around, uh, keen to watch. Uh, okay. Of course, how that information is being used or, or not, uh, we, we, we do not know. See, yeah. um, but uh, it's interesting because in, in your system on the Kerguelen Plateau, it's very similar to the Benguela in that sense that the, uh, uh, the fishing fleet is always in the same spot. Um, so, uh, so returning birds, um, if they've been in contact with uh, oily stuff uh, next to fishing vessels, they're, they're predicted to preen more than those uh, feeding on natural prey. Uh, but, I, but I guess, you know, Patagonian toothfish, they probably release far less oily stuff than, uh, than trawlers in the Benguela. Mm. Mm. 
yeah that's that's interesting then then i yeah i don't know if if that could be a, a way to yeah to say to the others where the boats are and maybe they're not interested in boats anyway but, um. <laughs> yeah okay do we have any uh any questions Otherwise, just a, qu uh, a quick one. Uh, I was I was kind of uh, curious. So this this analysis, um, were there any big surprises in there f for you? Was it was it something you noticed in the data while looking on other chapters, or did you have a, a purely theoretical approach uh, where you had a set of, of hypotheses and and then uh, started to dig into the data? Kind of a mix of both. Um... So, um, so uh, yeah, I was interested in looking at, at the large-scale foraging fidelity in different bird species, and, and I, and then because for another chapter of my PhD, I looked at interaction of birds with boats. Then I tried to combine the two, and and then and then we published that. And the the, the idea was just well, when they find a boat, then the next trip they don't go back to the same place, well, the, the same general direction. That was mm. our first conclusion. And then the reviewers asked for more details on the scale, and I had to dig into more analysis and test hypotheses. And I was very surprised that this future versus past thing worked. And yeah, so good good work from the reviewers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kyle suggests that maybe they just smell the sub sub Antarctic gyre. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think with that we'll probably call it quits. It's uh, 1700 GMT, so I think some of us probably have things to do and people to see and all that. Julianne. Thank you very much, Merci, for your paper. That was fantastic. Um, very, very interesting stuff. And um, mm -hmm. Orla, Kyle, thank you again for joining us. Nat, thank you so much for being our guest host today and introducing that first paper. That was very lovely. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, more, it's more my than my pleasure. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad you found pleasure from it. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, with that, I hope you all stay safe, take care. Um, it's all crazy times at the moment, but we're all getting mm -hmm. bit by bit. Thanks right? for thanks for joining everyone. Yep. Exactly. 20th, 20th session. 20th session. That's that's awesome. I'm super stoked. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks everyone. You take care now. Oh, Jan is dancing for us. Or, or celebrating or cheering. Jan, you've shaved. <laughs> <laughs> I, I turn your camera back on, Jan. <laughs>